Anna here. Sullivan here. Rello here. Excuse me. Laura here. Aldani here. Snooper here. Chandler here. Great, thank you. So I will, for the record, read in just the um, the meeting guidelines, just so that we have that. The City of Oak Creek is authorized to hold this public meeting remotely during the COVID-19 public health emergency under the March 16th and March 20th advisories from the Office of Open Government and the Wisconsin Department of Justice. Per the advisories, this meeting being conducted via Zoom video conference with telephone conferencing capabilities was duly noted, noticed per the City of Oak Creek Municipal Code and statutory notice requirements more than 24 hours in advance of the meeting. Members of the public have been advised of the options for participation via direct mailing to property owners within 300 feet of a proposal, which this doesn't count, via the COVID-19 information page on the city's website, via social media, and via the information contained on the meeting agenda. This meeting may also be viewed at the city's YouTube page, the link for which was contained in all aforementioned notice methods. The meeting recording will also be accessible on the city's YouTube page within 48 hours. Plan commissioners and participants are initially muted upon joining the meeting. Plan commissioners and staff have the ability to mute and unmute their microphones throughout the meeting. Please mute at all times except for roll call, motions, voting, and when recognized by the chair. Roll call and voting will occur per the usual and customary procedures starting from plan commissioner seating positions south to north in the common council chambers. The chair will facilitate questions and comments by calling on each plan commissioner or by requesting the use of the raise hand function in the Zoom webinar control panel. Only speak once you've been recognized by the chair or moderator. Applicants, the representatives, and all other participants who wish to speak will be unmuted when there is a direct request for information from the plan commissioner staff, when the applicant utilizes the raise hand function within the Zoom webinar control panel and the moderator verbally indicates that they are unmuted, when a phone participant dials star nine to indicate that they wish to speak and the moderator verbally indicates that their line is open. When unmuted, all participants must state their name and address for the record and then proceed with comments or questions. Questions and comments may also be entered into the Q&A function within the Zoom webinar control panel. Staff and or the moderator will monitor this function during the meeting and provide the information requested. There shall be no private messages or side conversations during the meeting utilizing the chat or Q&A functions. Chat and Q&A messages are part of the public record. And just for the public record, Mayor Dan may uh, join us a little bit late and Alderman Guzikowski will not be able to join us. So. Alderman Lorick is chairing this meeting and you may proceed chair. Thank you. Um, so we will move on to item three, uh, zoning code update discussion. The plan commission will review and discuss draft articles five through nine of the proposed zoning code with staff and consultants from Housel Levine Associates, no action taken. Carrie. Thank you. Chair, and we are going to start the discussion. I'm gonna turn it over to our consultant, Jackie, who is with us on the call and she will be leading the discussion with you. And if Jackie could have the ability to share her screen, please. We'll go ahead and, and share my screen. Please let me know if you all are able uh, to see this. Looks like I'm getting some nods, very good. Um, so thank you all so much for um, holding this special meeting to review um, the next uh, few sections of the, the updated zoning code. Um, so today we're going to have a brief overview of the update process and then um, an overview of the draft articles. Uh, we know that this is um, a lot of draft material to be presenting all in one meeting. So we really wanna highlight uh, the major changes, the major proposed changes to get your feedback and input on those. And then we'll have a brief discussion on next steps as well. Um, so the, the zoning code update process is a six step process, very similar to your comprehensive plan update process. So it started with a kickoff uh, with staff um, and that was in October 2019. Um, so we met with uh, staff, not only the, the planning staff, but also staff from other city departments uh, to better understand the issues um, and concerns that they all have uh, with the existing regulations. That brought us into engagement and that also took place in October of 2019. Uh, we held a couple of workshops um, to get public input on the um, existing regulations. 
Uh, so both staff input, public input, and then our um, expertise in zoning uh, led to the diagnostic report. And this was a, a deep dive into your existing regulations, including our uh, recommendations on how to update the code and modernize and make it more user friendly. Um, so that was presented to you all in April of 2020. Um, and then in August of 2020, we presented the, the first section of uh, draft uh, zoning ordinance uh, chapters, the district standards. So all things um, you know, related to the districts uh, was presented in that first meeting. Um, and today we'll go through the development standards and administration. So going through the um, overview of the draft articles, um, so we're here to talk about Article 5, the general development standards, Article 6, sign standards, Article 7, planned unit development standards, Article 8, administration and enforcement standards, and last but not least, Article 9, non-conforming uses, structures, and lots. So starting off with our general development standards, this section consolidates existing regulations that pertain to um, development across zoning districts. So things that would impact a development, whether it's in a uh, commercial district, a multifamily district, an industrial district, things like parking, loading, driveways, sidewalks, fences, et cetera. Uh, so we'll go through a few of these in more detail, the ones that have really been uh, proposed for change. Starting off with off-street parking. Um, so new standards are proposed for vehicular cross access and bicycle parking. So vehicular cross access, the goal there is to reduce curb cuts, uh, to increase safety in your commercial corridors, um, to require uh, that when feasible, uh, developers and property owners have uh, you know, driveways connecting parking lots across different properties. And then bicycle parking, requiring that some bicycle parking be um, established uh, for applicable development types. Uh, there's not a specific amount um, of bicycle parking that would be uh, required, um, but there would be a re uh, requirement for, for some bicycle parking to be provided. Next, the uh, minimum parking requirements have been updated to reflect industry standards. So currently, um, a lot of your uh, parking minimums uh, really are, are too much. They're too high of a standard. Uh, so it's requiring that um, a lot of land area be dedicated to parking that could otherwise be uh, developed um, in a more uh, fruitful way. And so those uh, parking minimums have been um, adjusted to really reflect um, industry standard um, from the Institute of Transportation Engineers. We're also introducing a maximum parking requirements. Um, so this would be a not to exceed amount of parking. Um, and we're looking at 20% above that minimum requirement. Um, so this is really to ensure that developers aren't able to um, just you know, pave their whole lot with parking. There'd have to be some um, maximum there, some uh, ceiling uh, that they would hit. Um, and then the, the rest of the lot would have to be dedicated to, to open space um, or, or landscape areas. Um, if the developer, the property owner can prove uh, to the community development director uh, that they really do need additional parking, uh, they could provide that proof um, and evidence of, of use and demand for additional parking, um, and that could be approved administratively. Are there any questions on the off-street parking, especially the parking maximum, since that's a new idea that's being proposed? All right, hearing none, we can move right into the off-street loading. Um, so we're proposing that the um, off-street loading requirements, um, that minimum number of loading spaces that be eliminated. Um, so this is a, a trend we're seeing in a lot of municipalities across the United States, especially those um, that do have a, a larger trucking industry like Oak Creek does. Um, so minimum loading space requirements um, can really hamstring developers into um, providing more loading spaces than may be required um, when they're based on the square footage of the building. Uh, so some new uh, freight developments um, or warehousing uh, types of uses uh, don't need quite as many loading spaces or maybe need more loading spaces than what those minimum uh, requirements are. So instead of having that minimum spelled out and really prescribed within the code, we're recommending uh, that that be left to developer discretion. Um, and then to ensure that uh, the loading spaces uh, that are uh, you know, left to the developer discretion aren't going to um, impose you know, negative impacts on uh, the rest of the site, uh, there would be new standards for the location of those loading spaces, how you access them, um, and how you demarcate them as loading spaces as opposed to parking or pedestrian walkways. 
Next, moving into driveways. Um, so we're proposing some new standards for driveway design, um, including standards for ribbon driveways, uh, which are a more um, green infrastructure friendly uh, type of driveway design where you don't have quite as much um, impervious surface. We're also recommending that standards be proposed for single family parking pads. Um, so these would be um, areas um, off to the side of the driveway where um, a single car could be parked um, currently that um, is not regulated and uh, the, the driveway standards really accommodate those. And since we're limiting the, the width and the amount of, of driveway that um, a single family home can have, have, uh, we're introducing and proposing these parking pad standards to really accommodate that additional uh, car parking in um, a driveway area. We're also um, proposing new standards for multifamily and non-residential driveway locations. So next, moving into landscape, these are some fully new regulations that are being proposed, um, and they um, integrate requirements of the new Milwaukee County Stormwater Management Ordinance. Um, so we worked uh, to refine uh, these proposed regulations uh, with a consultant that's working with the county on those stormwater regulations. Uh, so we're recommending that four landscape areas be uh, established. The parking lot perimeter, uh, which is shown here in the purple in the graphic, parking lot interior, which is the big blue area, building foundation, which is the yellow, and the transition areas, uh, which is the green. So starting off with that parking lot perimeter area, uh, this would be a buffer between uh, the sidewalk, the public right of way, and the parking lot. So it's really meant to help screen um, uh, bumpers and to screen um, headlights uh, to create a more pedestrian friendly environment. For the parking lot interior, this would include both uh, parking medians, uh, which you see here in the middle of this graphic, and parking lot islands, which you see here. So this is really meant to um, encourage um, on-site stormwater management, um, improve um, that it's stormwater absorption, and um, really help to beautify parking lots as well. These are a couple of example photos of what those medians uh, might look like. Um, the, the one on the left hand side here shows an inlet um, that would allow for uh, stormwater to then drain into that median area uh, to increase that stormwater absorption. Next, moving into the building foundation landscape requirement. Um, so this would be landscape that's at the base of a building. Um, to really help soften that and increase the um, appearance, improve the appearance um, of buildings um, as they transition from uh, building entrances to parking lot or um, other sort of uh, public areas. And then last but not least, we're proposing uh, four types of transition areas. Um, so these would um, increase in their intensity uh, based on adjacent uh, land uses. Um, so here we have uh, the type A, the yard A, uh, type of transition area and then um, the more uh, dense uh, transition areas shown um, here in this in these graphics um, so based on the adjacent land use um, a development would need to um, establish these different transition types uh, so for example if um, there is a commercial use adjacent to a residential use they would have a more um, intense transition area requirement uh, than if it were uh, two commercial uses uh, adjacent to one another any questions or concerns about the proposed landscape regulations? Uh, Jackie, just to, uh, before I get too far, sorry, I wanted to make sure that um, we recognize that there was a chat uh, submission. Uh, Director Seymour would like to hear the Planning Commission's thoughts on residential parking in particular, but also if Planning Commissioners have any thoughts or questions um, at this point from what we've and maybe just to clarify things, Carrie, you know, it is a change from what we've been doing in the sense that we're limiting uh, some of the areas that can be paved on residential lots for those parking areas. It's a little bit more limiting than we, than we have right now and recognizing that that's probably something that happens, occurs in the community uh, that creates some, some discussion. Uh, I just like to make you guys aware of that and you know, feel free to comment on that. Maybe you need to Go back to that, thing, that example. So, essentially, you know, where we, where you see, um, and there's plenty of examples which show that you know people, you know, paving over good significant portions of their front yard for additional parking spaces, 
that would not be allowed under this new proposed zoning code. Uh, this is Christine. I actually have a question. So if if I understand this correctly from the figure that we have on the screen, so the gray area, which is the paved area, is only where they allow to park, not on the street, not on the lawn, not anywhere else. Is that correct? Well, I mean, street parking would be regulated by whatever the traffic regulations are. But yeah, definitely uh, we would not, and we don't allow it right now, people to park on grass that's going to pave surface. What this, you know, what this thing does is it defines where that paved surface can be as opposed to our current code, which gives a lot more leeway in terms of which areas of your lot you can pave for parking. And we see that happen mostly on, along the arterial streets where, where parking, street parking may be an issue, but it, it has, and I hate to base our entire zoning code on it, on a few examples, but I mean, it, it really has gotten out of hand in some cases where the entire front yard is, is paved and there's really very little that we can point to in the code, which would restrict people from doing that. So um, I'm gonna use this uh, dashed line here as maybe that's a right of way. Uh, sometimes like if there is a ditch or something, this is beyond the right of way. So who is gonna maintain that if it's paved all the way to the road? maintain the driveway uh, not the okay so sometimes the driveway goes like the the property owner it goes beyond the right of way limit it goes even before that do you see where the front street is yes okay so from that dash black line all the way to the front street this is outside the right of way right yeah and that happens i would say in almost every case Correct. where the i mean there's a portion of what people consider to be their driveway, which is actually part of the city's right of way. And exactly. in those cases, the, the homeowner, the adjacent property owner is expected to maintain that. So they are. And does it have to be the same type of uh, material? Like if they put it asphalt and if we have concrete or the vice versa, it's still on them to match that or it doesn't matter? Yeah, Matt, I think we require, uh, do we require concrete or for the approach and then okay. they, can, they can pave it with asphalt uh, beyond that? Um, it, it depends on where you're at. So if you're in a uh, rural type section, which is ditches, um, we allow asphalt. Um, if you have curb and gutter with um, sidewalk and that, we uh, require concrete. So there, it, it depends on what type of section you're dealing with as far as the uh, roadway facility. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. Um, Doug, can can you uh, can you kind of explain exactly what we're even looking at here? Like, what's the the five, the six A, the six C, to help okay. just kind of understand what? And maybe Jack can do that. Uh, the six, starting at six A, obviously that's the that's the driveway approach width. Uh, six. Do we even have a six B? Yeah, right so here. this is an example graphic only, and I want to uh, reiterate that for all of the uh, graphics that are included here, these, um, they're really just to help illustrate uh, the proposed regulations, they will be refined um, and revised uh, to reflect the, the proposed regulations for Oak Creek once you all give us the thumbs up that we're moving in the right direction. And, and we, are, we are showing the two six C, so we have to clarify that and maybe change that, but okay. the one uh, on the top of the page shows that the, the allowable width for the, the paved driveway is restricted to the width of the garage. That's one of the changes that we we're talking about. And it also allows for, I'm not sure if, if, this, uh, if this graphic adequately shows that, it allows for the kind of a driveway flare uh, for the first, uh, forgive me, I don't recall the max the number of feet uh, past the, the garage doors. So again, we don't have you know, uh, especially in the case where you have three or more car, car garages, and we we have a kind of a constant uh, driveway width at the lot line, and it can flare out towards the width of the garage, uh, only in that last, I think, what is it, 18 feet, 20 feet? Yes, 20 feet. 20 feet? So would this, uh, I'm, I'm assuming as with any change in code that uh, existing would be grandfathered in. So this would be 
Um, this would pertain to new construction or new driveways being put in. Um, and well, also, go ahead, sorry. So, sorry, and, I, and also, um, is there, would there be as in, I guess, any request for variance? Is, I mean, is there a, a standard for variance requests to be looked at as a, on a case by case basis um, outside of this? So I think, I think there's, there's two parts to your question. Um, and I, what, what I'm gonna say, I'm, I'm gonna let Jackie jump in here in just a minute, but you know, the second question is a little bit easier in terms of uh, you know, uh, materials and things like that, because we are still incorporating standards that are the engineering department's domain. So variances on a case-by-case -case basis would be um, per the engineering department. Um, and I apologize, Alderman Lorick, what was your first question? Um, I, I just, and that was an assumption on my part, but um, existing would be grandfathered in, so right. this would apply to new and existing. Or new and new. existing with, with some uh, caveat to allow for um, the ability to do um, uh, retrofit standards in some cases. Yeah. And I think the, the key word, which what we didn't say is legally uh, non-conforming, because there's a lot of people out there that, that have gone closer to the lot line than they should. And so in those cases where things were done that don't even meet the standard today, we're not just gonna just say that's okay, you know, from here on forward, you have to meet the new code. So if it's determined, and this is, you know, obviously a very difficult task sometimes, but if you have a legally conforming driveway right now that doesn't meet these standards, yeah, we're not going to come out there and make you change it. I mean, it's, it's you're able to carry that forward under a grant profit clause. Okay, thank you. I have a question. What about a U shaped driveway? I've seen a few of those in the city. Is there any consideration of that? I know it's not a standard design, but a few new homes, people have put those in. Um, so the way that this uh, section is drafted, um, a single family residential property would be limited to uh, one driveway and one curb cut. Um, and that's really to um, improve traffic flow, improve safety, um, you know, from the pedestrian level, um, and then to also help um, with uh, stormwater management issues um, and, and minimizing that impervious surface on a lot. Thank you. Any other questions or concerns about driveways? Are there any questions or concerns about the landscape, uh, proposed landscape requirements? Uh, this is Chassie. I do have a question. For the parking lot interior, interior area, um, can you go to the draft? Yes, this one right here. So, is there a requirement that, um, for example, where the number three is pointing to, where you have a very long piece of uh, landscaping area? in the middle of the parking lot. And the reason I asked this question um, from prior meetings, it was identified that it's sometimes easier for snow removal, not to have such a, a long piece right there in the center. So is there some requirement that it has to be um, a long landscaping area or can it be broken up? So the requirement as it's written currently, there would be a median uh, requirement. So it would be that, that long strip of landscaping down the middle. And that would be, um, and I'm checking my notes just to make sure I'm not uh, saying the wrong thing, but it'd be for every third bay of parking. Uh, so you have one, two, three bays here. So the third one would be uh, required to have that median. Um, whether they want to um, locate those mediums in certain locations to make it easier for their snow removal, they would have the ability to do that, uh, but they wouldn't be able to uh, lower the number of mediums that are provided. 
Okay, and so for that media, uh, could they only have trees, uh, no grass? Is that what you're stating? So the uh, median, you are required to uh, plant one canopy tree and 15 shrubs or native grasses for each 50 linear feet of parking lot median space. Um, so you'd have uh, one tree and then native shrubs or grasses. There wouldn't be like grass or, or that type of um, you know, ground cover uh, requirement, uh, but there would be trees and uh, shrubs or native grasses that would be required to be planted. Well, see, are you kind of referring to the situations we've seen in the past where people would just stone those? Uh, uh, please repeat, Doug. Are you referring to, in, is your question more relating to, can people just throw down gravel or mulch or something like that and not have grass in those landscaping areas? Yes, because it's easier for upkeep ver versus having grass there, especially with the snow removal, yes. And I thought, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, Jack, or, or Carrie, I thought we did have a requirement for for turf coverage or some type of living uh, plant material there to prevent people from just you know, taking the, the landscaping medians and the landscaping islands and basically turning them into just stone. Yeah, so we do have a uh, requirement that a minimum of 75% of the surface area of a parking lot island or median be planted in ground cover. Yep. Um, and ground cover is identified as um, herbaceous plants other than turf grass, um, normally reaching an average maximum height of 18 inches at maturity. Thank you. Uh, this is Christine Hanna. I have a question actually. And regarding to uh, a number one area where the median with the grass area is being used or proposed here, um, is the business have the flexibility to use this uh, a grass median for pedestrian walkway or for example, the one by Target here in Oak Creek, they use this median to create not from the fully section, but at the first front section for the pedestrian to get out of their vehicle and just move forward to the business. Is that something that's possible or no? Um, so there is a um, encouragement in the uh, parking standards section uh, to co-locate pedestrian walkways um, along the, um, the, the landscape medians to really create a more pedestrian um, oriented um, environment within a parking lot. Uh, that wouldn't mean that they could um, not plant uh, the required um, amount of landscaping. Uh, they could just perhaps make that median wider to um, incorporate that pedestrian walkway, uh, maybe put it uh, to the uh, next to it um, or, or somehow otherwise uh, incorporated into that median. Um, but that's encouraged, that's not required. I and mean, they would still have to meet all of those um, minimum landscape requirements that are included in the code, are proposed to be included in the code. And the minimum landscape required be done elsewhere or does it to be within specific locations? So there are um, landscape requirements for the specific locations, um, whether that is, um, you know, every, so the requirement for the median is uh, one canopy tree and 15 shrubs or native grasses per uh, 50 lineal feet of the median. That doesn't necessarily mean that the designer, um, the landscape architect that, that designs the parking lot would need to, um, you know, space the tree um, every 50 feet. Uh, there, there is some flexibility built in uh, to the regulations to allow for creativity and design. Um, so if the um, developer, you know, has some creative ideas, uh, you will have some flexibility in your review um, of those landscape plans. Okay, thank you. Uh, this is Chassie. I had a question about the transition areas and the different types of um, the different options that can be used. So what's written here, you can use fencing as an option. Uh, do you have a picture of the fencing? Yeah, so you can see it um, in these graphics sort of behind uh, the trees. And it's included here for all of these um, where in the 
um, proposed uh, transition area types Row Creek, it would only be required in type C and type D. Um, so it would be an optional um, addition in types A and types B. And the reason I bring this up with the, for example, Drexel Town Square, some of those transition areas, I think they are, what did you say, a C or a D location, yet they don't have the fencing. So is there a specific requirement depending on the area that uses the fencing or should use it or not? So the um, existing development in the Drexel Town Square, um, and, and Doug and Carrie, please correct me if I'm incorrect, um, that would all be governed through the Drexel Town Square PUD. Um, so the, that PUD process would still um, allow for flexibility from these uh, landscape requirements, you know, based on that overall master plan that's being proposed. Um, so that that's flexibility in, in terms of uh, landscape is still built into that PUD process. Um, you know, if there were areas that currently don't uh, conform to these uh, landscape requirements um, as they redevelop, as uh, they are reinvested in, uh, they would have to then uh, comply uh, with these new standards. And so once again, depending on um, the particular company or business, they can choose any of these. Am I understanding that correctly? So it's based on the uh, land use of the subject lot. So if my lot is um, a, a retail establishment, so I'm just a, uh, you know, a store um, that sells whatever, you know, um, I can't think of a good example, I apologize, but just a retail establishment, um, and I'm next to a service establishment, then that would just be a type A buffer. So the one, the least intense one here on the on the screen. Um, and then there's a table in section 170505B4C that details all of the, the subject land uses and then the adjacent land uses. Um, and those are based on the, um, the land use table that's included in, um, I believe it's article three. Um, so if you're one of those uses that fall under the, the retail category, um, then you would uh, have to meet the standards that are included in that table uh, based on the adjacent lot, the use of the adjacent lot. Um, so if I'm a, a retail establishment moving um, in next door to a single family residential home, the uh, transition yard requirement would be more intense than if I'm um, adjacent to another commercial type of use. Thank you. Any other questions or comments on the proposed landscape regulations? I, I have uh, another question and I want to say this is for Doug, possibly Carrie. Uh, one of the um, items that we were, we were reviewing in one of our prior meetings um, included uh, landscaping. And one of the challenges was that the trees were on a very high berm. And so it was potentially causing issues, not screening the way that it should have been. So is there anything in here that we need to note for those special cases? So I believe that within the landscape section, which is actually quite lengthy this time in, in, the, in the code update, we do have species or at least um, some guidance for where certain areas are uh, or certain landscape types are appropriate. Um, obviously, if we have something like a berm, we have to talk about what kinds of plants are actually able to survive on that kind of berm. Mm -hmm. um, it has to do with soil types, it has to do with the, the height of the berm um, and, and how that is constructed. We have to do, you know, we have to take those things into consideration. But I think the code does give us some guidance with, with those particular cases. Um, we don't need to necessarily be... Um, experts in those in in those areas but we do have guidance thank you 
And that's a great transition to the, the next portion of the landscape ordinance we wanted to review. And those are some new standards that are being proposed for species diversity, uh, tree preservation and installation and maintenance. So the species diversity um, spells out um, not the, you know, the different types of species that are required to be um, within a, a landscape plan, uh, but the percentage of different uh, landscape elements based on their, um, their genus and their, um, their ability to, um, to have that correct species mix. So depending on the size of the landscape area, you'd be required to have a greater variety of species types. Um, and then the uh, tree preservation standards uh, would be proposed for a uh, new development. Uh, so it'd be uh, when someone is proposing new development, they would have to inventory all of the um, existing viable trees. So those would be trees that have um, a diameter at breast height of 12 inches or more. Um, so all of those you know, larger, more substantial trees on the lot would have to be identified. And then any of those trees that they are uh, going to propose to um, take down, they would have to include those um, in that plan and their removal plan. And then there is a, um, a table including, included in that section for uh, the tree replacement rate. Uh, so based on the size of the tree that's proposed to be taken down, there is a number of trees that would have to be replaced on site to make up for that. Um, and then for the installation and maintenance requirements, this is some new language that would ensure um, the city has some teeth uh, in enforcing these new landscape standards. Um, and there is a requirement for um, there to be a um, some sort of insurance um, not insurance provided, but a, a total cost of the estimate for the landscape. Um, and then there would have to be um, money put down to ensure that that is uh, then installed and maintained going forward. Jackie, just a quick question and, and, and my memory fails me at this point. I mean, we had talked about th these standards apply to landscaping as part of a plan commission review of a development. Can you just kind of speak to the, uh, the issue and whether we want to take it up about having a tree preservation ordinance such that, I mean, as we've seen before, uh, to kind of skirt that, people will just cut down all the trees, then come to the planning commission. Yes, yeah, so there is a um, section here that if, uh, you know, the trees are all, you know, taken down before there's any type of uh, review, uh, there would be a greater amount, a greater number of trees that would then have to be replaced. So that tree replacement rate would be greater than uh, for trees that um, were demolished that were supposed to be included in that uh, tree removal plan. Any other questions or comments about uh, species diversity, tree preservation, or the new installation and maintenance regulations? All right, then we can go ahead um, and move on to uh, fences. Um, so uh, one of the biggest changes to the, the fence regulations would be proposed prohibition um, of chain link and similar fence materials in single family districts. So uh, many communities are moving towards uh, prohibiting uh, these more undesirable fence types in uh, single family residential areas uh, to really improve the overall appearance of the community. So as Oak Creek transitions away from being more of a, a rural um, area to uh, a more metropolitan subdivision um, or suburb, excuse me, um, these types of uh, higher design standards, especially for residential areas, uh, really become more viable and important. We're also proposing that the um, height of fences in uh, street facing side yards or in uh, corner side yards uh, be restricted similar to uh, fences in front yards. Um, and this is really to help promote uh, sort of a neighborhood community feel uh, to ensure that you know uh, when you're walking through your neighborhood, walking through your community, um, it's not up against a, um, a big tall fence. Uh, there is some visibility, some eyes on the street. Um, so the proposed restriction here would be for five, I'm sorry, a four foot maximum um, if that fence is located on the property line. And then if the fence is located 10 feet from the property line, they could go up to six feet, uh, but they would have to improve that area between the fence um, and the right of way uh, with landscape. Any questions or concerns about the proposed changes to the fence regulations? 
Just, so. just, a, just a comment, and uh, I'd just like, again like to get the commission's thoughts. I mean, the the pretty significant change moving away from the chain link fence, and, and, and a, a full disclosure, I've got a chain link fence in my yard. I know I, I'm looking out my window right now. I can see probably six of my neighbors have chain link fences. So I mean, if that's the direction that the commission and the council wants to go, that's great. I just want to make sure that you know that's a very prevalent type of uh, material that's being used, not only in Oak Creek, but I suspect elsewhere. And yeah, also and we have not had many requests in terms of um, permits of late, uh, I would say in the last year for strictly chain link fences in residential neighborhoods. And that's per the zoning administrator. We've had a couple, but not many. Most of the fences that have been proposed recently have been um, wood fences. And some of the, the gates have been chain link, but um, from what I understand, there have not been many requests um, in the last year for chain link in residential areas. It's more prevalent in the, in, the, uh, in the commercial and more even so in the industrial locations. I'm how sorry, Alderman Lorick, you had a question? Yeah, I was just curious, how common is a prohibition on chain link fence or I guess in communities around here? Are other communities doing that? Do you know? I would have to check the uh, zoning ordinances of adjacent or more regional communities, but in uh, the communities that we've worked in, um, many are moving towards a prohibiting chain link fence in residential areas, if not um, a complete prohibition of prohibition of chain link in front yards uh, to really help improve the appearance of residential areas from the street. Okay. Yeah. And my, my only concern is, as Doug kind of brought up, they seem so prevalent now. Um, I don't know. I, I'm not in the fencing industry, so I don't know cost restrictions, um, what different options would be, and if if certain families or certain properties would have some type of a cost restriction from putting in another type of fence. Um, it, it might be something where we look at um, just the visible yard, just the, the front yard or, or things like that. So one of the um, you know biggest pushes or uh, recommendations of the comprehensive plan was to increase standards of development um, in the community and not just for, for commercial areas, industrial areas, but also um, in residential neighborhoods as well. So this is uh, one of the ways that we're proposing that that recommendation from the comp plan uh, be incorporated into the revised uh, zoning ordinance. So definitely recognize um, that uh, a overall prohibition of chain link could be um, cost restrictive to some households um, so the restriction only in the front yard, um, I think, is one way of sort of having that happy medium. Hey, this is Christine. I have a, actually a question. So I have observed, uh, especially along 13th Street, some of the backyard they are visible from the road. They do have existing chain link fences. And um, I'm not sure if existing chain link fences are going to be revised or is just going to remain as is and just for future ones? Yes. Yeah, so um, like the majority of other um, regulations that are proposed to be changed, um, those that are, um, so the chain link fence that was, um, you know, legally um, erected uh, would be allowed to remain as a, a legal nonconformity. Um, if there was substantial rehabilitation or if someone was, um, you know, putting in a, a fully new fence, replacing their existing fence, they would then have to comply uh, with the new regulations. But it wouldn't um, mean that, you know, the city is going to go around making people tear down their chain link fences. It's just as people reinvest in their property or, or build new fences um, that this uh, new regulation uh, would come into play. Okay, so how about the, the residents that they are, they're back yard even though it's not required it's only required on the front yard but it's their backyard is exposed to the to the road and it's being visible so do those have like specific situations or they are still dealt with as it's allowed yeah so as the um the regulation is currently uh, written, currently drafted, um, that would be a prohibition of chain link in, in all of the yards. Um, so um, Commissioner Lorick um, had the recommendation or the um, idea of having that restricted only in the front yards uh, to really help with the, um, the cost effectiveness of this new regulation um, to address. Um, so if, if that's the direction uh, that the, the plan commission would like to 
to go into, um, we could look at um, requiring um, or prohibiting chain link um, in yards that are visible from a right of way. Um, so instead of uh, calling out a uh, the front yard and the street facing side yard saying any yard that's visible, uh, you know, adjacent to a public right of way uh, would be prohibited from using chain link. Um, if that's the direction the plan commission would prefer to go in. Yeah, I think that would be improving and following the, the, uh, the zoning and the plan. Uh, I'm sorry, I have a noise in the background. Um, I think that would be a preferable because that will enhance the properties and the visibility from the road as well, so. This is Dawn. Um, I, I love the idea of removal of chain link fences in our city um, going forward. Um, I'm just not sure how viable it is. If, if somebody has a broken fence that's part that's chain linked to replace you know, an area or to replace all of it. I mean, I just think that there's gonna be some pushback on it, um, but maybe we just start with like, can we put a, you know, it's like new construction of residential cannot have chain link fences or can you not even, you know, can you put in a stipulation like that? Yeah, so that's a great point. So um, when is this uh, new regulation going to be triggered? So as your current, uh, non-conformity uh, language is written and as we'll get into uh, more when we get into that section, um, you would only be required to comply with the new regulations um, if you are substantially uh, rehabilitating there is. Um, so for fences, um, and that's 50%. Um, um, so if you are replacing half of your fence, you would be required uh, to then comply with these new standards. If it's just a section, a small amount of fence, uh, you would be able to replace that and maintain that without having to replace uh, the entire thing. Yeah, and I, I, I agree with um, Commissioner Hannah, who brought up um, visible from the right of way versus um, targeting front yard only. Um, and just to echo uh, Commissioner Carrillo on um, other existing chain link fences, um, I wouldn't, I guess it would could be prohibitive if, if there's two homes on a given street that have chain link fences and the yard in the middle or even a, a neighboring yard wants to put in a fence and, and unfortunately now they're being told no, they can't put in chain link even though it might match the surrounding area already, I don't know that it would detract any differently by putting in a chain link where there's existing chain link already, um, but definitely targeting the, the visible from the, um, from the right of way I can see. There's also an option if we wanna kind of have a little bit more flexibility in incorporating some of the requirements that we are proposing for increasing the height of the fence in street yards, if we wanted to say uh, chain link is prohibited in street, street yards or uh, street facing yards, front yards, what have you, but you still wanna have it in the remaining yards, you could have a requirement for landscaping, or if you don't want to prohibit that in street facing yards entirely, you could incorporate landscaping as a buffer as well. It's an option. I'm not sure exactly how it would work or how viable it is because like we've said before, um, lots of fences just get put on property lines and maintenance and responsibility and, and, and things like that come into play as well. Um, it's an option if you want to consider it. Um, throwing it out there for, for consideration for the plan commission. Terry, I think the challenge with that, and I don't disagree with that, is that you're gonna have, again, like you said, this kind of, kind of sawtooth edge of, of fences and, and landscaping. And again, the challenges of maintaining that uh, are very real and, and you're just kind of having this no man's land where, where, where no one can access or take care of it. So uh, I kind of I get that. I, 
uh, I think that may be very challenging to implement. Uh, I, I, you know, I, I think that the kind of the direction in which I felt that the planning commission was going with uh, having pro prohibition on chain link uh, in front yards, certainly, and in those areas that are adjacent to or visible from public rights away is probably uh, the more likely to be implemented uh, and carried through by the homeowners. I think I would like everybody to keep in mind what that would look like. If we are allowing side yards to be chain link, but requiring rear yards to be, or street facing yards to be something else, you, you might have a situation where people are either re requesting a variance to allow for it to be an entirely chain link fence, or if somebody is being um, strictly adhering to the code, you could have a section that is chain link and another section that is, for instance, just a wood fence. And sorry, I have joined the meeting. Sorry for being late, I apologize for that. Uh, just to throw out there, a little different situation, but if you remember the granite store on 27th by Menards some years back, uh, they put up a wood decorative fence against the neighborhood, the rest went chain link and it's a mess. It's, my opinion is it should be an all or nothing deal. That is also um, my preferred approach and what I would recommend uh, the direction the city move into is having the, the fully, um, the full prohibition on the chain link. Um, we know that this is uh, maybe gonna be a hard pill to swallow for, for residents and homeowners um, in the beginning, uh, but it is something that over time will really have a, a large impact on the appearance of, of residential areas in Oak Creek. Um, so as the, uh, the momentum picks up as more existing um, homes are being uh, reinvested in, redeveloped, uh, you really will see a, a big improvement, a big impact um, over time. So this is one of those things that uh, 10 years from now you can look back on, um, you know, this uh, zoning code update process and really see the, the fruits of that labor um, in the actual appearance of the city. Hello, I just want to let you know, I also joined the meeting, Chris Buzikowski. So in the chain link, you know, I, I don't know if it's true. I've seen people do iron, wrought iron. But I think chain link around uh, a shorter four footer around a pool. Uh, I think has been done within the city. Was there a discussion concerning that or are we just talking borders of yards? I think it's more we're talking about uh, property line fences. Okay, thank you. So fences um, required around pools and other types of uh, facilities like that would be covered in the building code rather than the zoning ordinance and those are for you know life safety issues uh, rather than for um, these sorts of appearance um, improvements. Okay, thank you for the clarification, Jacqueline. Uh, again, my two cents, so all or nothing that making it cheap on the back end, just, I, I, I think I agree with Jacqueline. This is something that gets cleaned up over time. Um, <clears throat> Don, you border, you have, you live on a street where everybody, just about everybody has a fence in their backyard. Um, I think they're all mostly wood but I, I don't know yeah, any chain link yeah. around Pennsylvania. I think there might be one kind of kind of hidden a little bit, but uh, yeah, we, we kind of have a weird situation where we actually on my block, we have two houses that are flipped and the front face is Pennsylvania and the rest face the back. So, they, and they have, uh, no one does, one has their backyard faces my, where I'm front and they have their fence right on the sidewalk. So I'm not sure if this would, how you would address that, um, where the backyard is on the sidewalk. Uh, but um, most, there is a few that have no fence and um, it looks like they just have a really huge backyard. 
the uh, since we're talking about that um, on the I'm looking at this where it says the side yards um, facing streets. Now I have a backyard that faces a street uh, that would just still be under backyard um, zoning rules, correct? As the um, regulations are drafted currently, yes. Okay. So we did have situation years ago where a person wanted to put that, that fence up. Um, technically they were a corner lot, so their side yard could only get a four footer. Uh, they wanted the six, they had a pool. Um, I know they, they got shot down for the variance and the, the home's pretty visible. Uh, it's on, a, it's on putes. I, they did a nice job with the fence. It's it's just odd when it changes like that. It's it's a really odd situation. You're saying the transition from the four foot section to the six foot section. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, many municipalities will require like a tapering uh, from the four foot to the six foot, so you don't have just a four foot section and then the six foot section right next door. There's some sort of um, some tapering required to maybe smooth that transition. And thank you for bringing that up because I, I think that would, would have really helped this particular situation as well as keeping the same style fence. It's, it is an all white fence, uh, but it kind of went from a dog ear total blockage to like a picket. So um, I, homeowner's choice, but again, I think consistency would have looked better. Dan, I actually live next door and my neighbors have one of those transition fences. It actually looks pretty good because it's a continuous fence. You, it, it starts out at, I don't know if it's three or four feet, but then it goes up to six feet once you get um, to just past the front plane of the house. Mm -hmm. it, you don't really notice it all that much. It's... Um, I can, I can definitely send you a picture giving you an idea of how that transition might work. Um, it doesn't mean that everybody is gonna do it the exact same way that they did, but it can be done and done well. Yeah, and there's a homeowner on 13th and Wilding, uh, corner, corner house, uh, street, the side lot faces 13th, the front faces Wilding, and he came in and he put a, a trellis thing, you know, you walk under with the gate, and then, you know, I, he had young kids, and but he kind of, uh, it, it kind of, oh, geez, what's the word I'm looking for? It was like a wave. It came to every section of fence post. It probably went up to five, five, four feet. It, it had some style to it. So, I mean, I think he kept it four on the sides. Uh, maybe he kept it that way all the way around. I'd have to go by. It's probably the one, the guy really put some money into his fence. He, if, if everybody did it that way, I don't think we'd be having these discussions. Um, but if, if you do have the chance, Greg, that's your district. If, you, if you're familiar with that, take a ride by. It's, it's a good one to see. Yeah. Just don't want to jump in here. Um, so I don't know if I really explained it well. What's going on on my street is... We have like a front yard sidewalk, side uh, road, sidewalk, front yard, front yard, front yard, front yard, and then you got somebody's house is flipped and they have the backyard with their fence right on the edge of the sidewalk. And I don't know if there, and I, I can't imagine there's too many houses like this. There's two on our block actually. Uh, if this would be considered a side yard, because now you have a fence right up on the sidewalk where most people have front yards. So Don, uh, I think addressed? in the current code, that's actually considered a through lot or it has where it has two, it has frontage on two streets. And there's a, there's something in the current code about which, which street is considered your front. I think in, in the future, we're hoping to prevent those types of situations, but it's a good call about how, if we were to receive a request for a replacement fence, for instance, in one of those situations, how the new code would address it. Yeah, my recommendation there would be um, having similar restrictions as the street facing side yard. So recognizing that, you know, people 
people want to use their, their backyard and have a privacy fence, uh, but then requiring a setback from the property line and some landscape in between so that, you know, when you're walking your dog or playing outside with your kids, uh, you don't just run up against this, this huge fence right on the the sidewalk right on the property line. Um, so having um, some setback there and some landscape uh, to really soften that wall um, if they want to have that uh, privacy six foot fence um, or if they want to have it at the property line, maximize their backyard space, um, having that be a four foot maximum. Any other well, questions? Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, no. Um, I guess we're, you know, I guess that's kind of where we're at. And um, I know, unfortunately, we do get those odd properties, but I, I guess I'm okay with the four foot at the property line. I guess I'm okay with that. The, does, do we take into account topography of a lot? So just say, for example, you got a side yard a side yard fence you want to put in and the lot at the lot line it slopes down maybe from where the actual backyard is a foot or two do we still go well you're gonna have a four foot fence and in essence maybe you're only a few feet above grade at where the backyard is does that make any sense because you know we have some pretty severe grades throughout some subdivisions and you know, it just for the swale or for the swales and the water to flow in between the homes and at, at the property lines. I don't know if I'm explaining this well. Versus, no, I, I think you, you, are, you are again, and there, there's always going to be those circumstances where there's going to be those one offs. Um, I think that again just makes it very difficult to administer on a staff level. You know, uh, you know, at you know, when push comes to shove, it's still at the property line. I mean, the fence needs to be so high. Um, so I, I know, and I know that there's there's many reasons why people would want to go higher uh, for for privacy or what, what have you. But I think you know that's in those situations. If there is a hardship there, that's really what a variance was designed for. And in those cases, would encourage people to do that rather than trying to you know draft or a requirement or a regulation that addresses you know, what will likely be a number of different scenarios for people. But I think the most common will be, you know, a grade that's manageable, that's not so drastic, that's gonna require some some changes in the height of the fence. Okay. Yeah, yeah, you're right, Doug. It, you, you, that makes complete sense. I, I guess I would support, you know, what, what makes it uniform and easiest on staff um, when people come through. And again, as Doug <laughs> said, I guess that's what variances are designed for to take into account those odd situations, uh, even like the one Don described. I just, this is uh, Chris Krzykowski. I just have one quick uh, question on this. Uh, the, these are, are these fences uh, for commercial and residential or is this just resident, um, just residential that we're talking about with the, with the uh, prohibition of chain link fences? So just I'm all for it. I just want to just, just trying to understand it. Thank you. Yeah, so this would uh, be just for your single family district. So just for your, your residential areas. Okay. Did we, was it uh, talked about for commercial district, uh, for commercial properties? Yes, so um, in uh, non-residential fences, and so in your commercial districts, um, you would be, um, the, as it's written currently, uh, side and rear property lines would be permitted to have fences. Um, and they could be up to eight feet in height, uh, but then um, in your commercial districts, fences in front yards uh, would not be permitted. Um, and then similarly in um, industrial areas, uh, but that maximum height would be uh, 10 feet instead of eight. Okay, thank you. Okay, this is Christine. I have a question here. So how about fencing between a commercial area and a residential backyard. Are they allowed to put chain link fence in the backyard of a resident? 
That is a, um, a great question. So that would be um, governed by those um, transition yard requirements that we have in the landscape standards. Um, so if they do choose uh, to have a chain link fence as their, their fence or wall material is required um, by the transition yard type, um, that would be supplemented uh, with a lot of um, trees and, and other types of landscape material that would help uh, to screen uh, that fence type. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Great question. Very good question. We just just wrestled with that with the post office a month ago. Um, although I wouldn't help with them, but um, we will find those coming up. So I guess I'm okay with what's proposed. That's my, I'll just leave it at that. All right, um, so if, if everyone agrees, we can uh, move on to our next uh, section, which is our sign standards. So that's moving on uh, to draft article six. Um, so this section had to be um, pretty wholesale updated, revised um, to comply with a Supreme Court decision um, in a case called Reed versus the town of Gilbert, Arizona. Um, so this decision came down in 2016 and it um, clarified that um, the language that we use on signs is protected under the First Amendment. Um, so that means that uh, sign regulations based on content are um, a violation um, of uh, your First Amendment rights. Um, so if, when that gavel came down, I would say probably 80% of municipalities across the United States, uh, you know, were, were looking at their sign ordinances and saying, oh goodness, you know, we have to really take a second look at how we regulate signs. Uh, and this especially was impactful on our temporary signs. Um, so signs that um, you might have different regulations for um, like real estate signs or election campaign signs. Um, all of these different types of signs that um, have different regulations based on what the sign is for. Um, so that's no longer um, allowed uh, based on the Supreme Court decision. So um, that was really the, the biggest uh, push or thrust uh, for these um, updates was to uh, bring the uh, regulations into compliance with this decision. Um, so here's our proposed outline uh, for the new chapter. Uh, so starting off with the purpose, compliance, and applicability, moving into how you measure signs, and then getting into the, to the real meat of the section. So the permitted sign types, um, standards for permanent signs requiring a permit, standards for temporary signs requiring a permit, and then standards for temporary signs not requiring a permit, and then those general sign regulations. So these are the uh, sections we really want to focus on with you all today. And so starting off with our uh, permitted sign types, um, so this is a, um, a table that's included in that draft section uh, that really helps to um, upfront set up you know, the types of signs that are permitted per district. So currently um, the, the types of signs um, or the organization of the sign ordinance is based on the districts rather than on the sign types. Um, so instead uh, we're sort of flipping it on its head uh, so that upfront you know what's allowed in your district and then you get into uh, the specific regulations for the different sign types. Um, so now we'll move into um, the permanent signs requiring a permit, the different standards for these types of signs. So starting off with the wall signs, uh, we're proposing that the maximum area allowance for wall signs uh, be based on uh, the percentage of the uh, facade that they're going to be placed on. Uh, so this really helps to ensure that these wall signs are proportional to the buildings that they're located on, um, but to ensure that you don't have, um, you know, some smaller buildings not having any type of allowance for signage, so really restricting um, too much uh, what their sign area could be. Uh, we're proposing that there be an absolute minimum established um, so that no matter what, um, a business is able to have adequate signage for their property. We're also proposing a absolute maximum. Um, so this would ensure that um, some of the, the really large industrial buildings you have in the community don't just have you know, humongous signs uh, based on that percentage of the facade. We're also proposing regulations for secondary wall signs, and that's shown in this graphic here on the left-hand side of the screen. Um, and you see this for grocery stores, um, pharmacies, you know, different types of uh, pretty, um, you know, regular retail establishments that might have 
um, you know, the, the sign of the, the grocery store, the name of the grocery store, and then over one entrance, it might say pharmacy over the next entrance, it might say, you know, Starbucks or something like that. Um, so it allows the, the developer, the property owner uh, to break up their overall sign allowance um, and then establishes some uh, separation requirements, um, requirements for the, the secondary wall signs to be subordinate in size um, to, to the primary wall sign, etc. Um, and then another big change that's being proposed is a prohibition of box and cabinet signs. Um, so instead, there would be a requirement for um, individually affixed letters or the appearance of individually affixed letters. And that would only be uh, for the wall signs. Um, and, and similar to the, the fence materials, it would be a way uh, to really improve the appearance of your commercial corridors over time. Any questions about the wall signs? So, I have a question about illumination. What about lighting these signs up? Yes, so um, wall signs can be illuminated either internally um, or externally. So having the lights shining on the sign or having those individual letters uh, be in internally illuminated themselves. Thank you. Uh, Jacqueline, pro prohibition of box cabinet signs. Uh, that's pretty standard type thing, particularly on these strip mall things. And I know, you know, typically now we, we draw a box around channel letters and things like that. And the area, even if it ain't illuminated or a sign gets in there. Are we, by saying we can't have any box or cabinet signs, are we really making it awfully difficult on, on companies to do that? And I'm, I'm trying to think of, a, of an example of someone that would have one. Um, not coming to mind real quick. I think maybe as an example, Mayor, I mean, the, the Drex, the uh, strip center on the north northeast corner of Drexel and Howell is a really good example in my estimation in a bad way of what you know, this type of just allowing people to do box signage can mean for a development. So from the standpoint that, yeah, there's a lot of box signs there. I mean, that's something that we often look at and as something that, again, as we try to improve the look of our commercial corridors, that's something we're moving away from or trying to move away from. Yeah, and, and I guess, you know, as you get a strip mall like that dog, and I am unmuted, right? Um, you know, when they do a, a thing like that, I mean, usually, I don't know if they do it for convenience, if the signs permanently mount it, they can just slide the plastic out of there that says company A, company B. I, I don't know how often that really happens, but. You're exactly right, Mayor. That's exactly what they do. And just to be clear, we currently do not allow box or cabinet signs in multi-tenant commercial buildings as part of the requirements for a master sign plan. So it's not entirely new to the code. It's making it much clearer that we are prohibiting box and cabinet signs throughout the city. I believe there is a, there is still an allowance for box and cabinet signs in manufacturing districts. This would eliminate it completely. Okay. Um, I would say, you know, it, it makes for a, a more diverse looking uh, development versus where they just plaster those signs on uh, given what their frontage is and then everything's the same. Yeah, we have found this to be another um, useful strategy in changing the appearance of commercial corridors over time. Uh, so the city's not going to go out and make everyone replace their, their existing box or cabinet signs, but as the, um, those businesses turn over, as new businesses come into existing buildings, um, there would be a requirement uh, to, to put up a new sign, um, and, and it, that could not be a box or cabinet sign. So over time, again, this is one of those things where 10 years from now, you'll uh, be looking, you know, driving down your commercial corridors and, and really see the, the fruits of this labor. I do have a question about sign measurement. So we do have a lot of signs that come in for applicants that come in for variances. 
because the actual size, the way the sign is measured is exceeds the limit. So is there a way that we can um, potentially measure the signs differently, uh, only looking at the verbiage? Yeah, so there, um, in the uh, sign measurement section, so the um, 0602, uh, the sign area would be um, measured differently based on whether the sign has a backing or not. Um, so if there is a, a sign backing that, you know, really is part integral, part of the sign, uh, that would be included in the sign measurement. Um, if they were just individually affixed letters, like uh, the graphic that's shown here, you would draw that um, shape around the letters themselves. It wouldn't be, you know, that, that box that the, they're placed into. It would be um, around those individual letters. So this is the same sign measurement standard we have today? No. No, it's different. Right now we, we draw a box around the entirety and you get penalized for the dead space. This would not penalize you for the dead space um, in this graphic here. All right. I'm good with that. That's a benefit for sure, I believe. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Yeah, I, I should clarify what Jackie was saying, or not clarify what she was saying, but clarify my words to uh, be more in line with what Jackie said. That's for individually affixed letters. If we're talking about a backer plate, for instance, the T-Mobile sign, the uh, Five Guys sign that has the, the, the rectangle on which the letters are affixed, then you count the rectangle. But if it's mm -hmm. just channel or raceway letters, you just count the letters. Correct. All right, so if there are no more questions on wall signs, we can move in uh, to our single tenant and multi-tenant monument signs. Um, so the, the overall area and height um, of these uh, signs would be based on the intensity of the district. So in your uh, lower intensity districts, your residential districts, um, you would have um, a smaller or lesser sign allowance, uh, whereas in your, your higher intensity districts, you would have more sign allowance. And that's really to accommodate the different scales um, of commercial development, industrial development that you have in the city. Um, and then there's a, a new requirement proposed for the uh, sign base, so the monument sign base, this area here, um, this area here, uh, to be proportional with the sign itself. Um, so instead of uh, measuring sign area as the entire monument sign, it would just be um, those individually affixed letters are these yellow um, areas. Um, so then uh, what you see uh, some developers doing sort of finding that loophole or taking advantage of that, um, the way of measuring signs uh, would be to have a, a sign base uh, that is a really an attention attracting device. So it's much larger than the sign itself uh, to really uh, be something to, to pull people's eyes to pull that attention to their sign. Um, so this requirement for, for the sign base to be proportional uh, to the sign itself really helps to um, minimize that um, you know, sign base being the attract, attack, attention attracting device rather than just the base of the sign itself. Uh, also proposing to have uh, landscape being required at the base of the sign. Um, so the, um, there would be some uh, landscape requirement um, around the sign itself to help just improve the appearance of that overall. Any questions or concerns with the single tenant and multi-tenant monument signs? Mm. I, I do have a question just in regards to the landscaping. So how will that occur if there's no other landscaping in the area? You always have to have some type of landscaping around each sign. Am I understanding yes. that correctly? Chaucy, yes. And that's actually a current requirement. So every monument sign is required to have landscaping at the base. Oh, okay. So this is not new or different. We may have just a little bit more clarity, but no, it's not entirely new. Okay. So Carrie, you're gonna to have to correct me because I'm probably way off, but what's our current monument sign height restriction? Eight foot? And that eight includes the base. Eight, eight, foot. eight feet tall for, for commercial and manufacturing. Um, we, don't, we don't specify base right now. Um, monument signs in residential districts are 
uh, six feet, maybe. Uh, you, uh, that I'm not entirely remembering that correctly, but it is smaller. Um, I want to take this opportunity to uh, just remind everybody that we have about 12 minutes before our regular plan commission meeting starts. So um, I don't want to stifle any of the conversation that we have because it's, it's a good conversation that we're having. We will have to schedule another one of these, uh, but I want to be mindful of everybody, everybody's time. And I want to thank Jackie right now uh, for all the work that she's been putting into this. And thank you for leading this meeting and this discussion. Okay. Um, I guess is should should we still you just keep, keep going. it? In, I just wanted to make sure everybody was aware of the time. Yeah, I know. I appreciate that, and we will have to log off this and get on to another call. Yeah. Yeah. I can. I just would like to request just like five minutes for bathroom break in between, so we don't have to literally go from one to another. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Um, I guess just for consideration, and again, we won't get through it tonight. Um, we have in the past, you know, looked at this where they put the base in and we go to 10 foot. Um, should we just keep our standard eight and deal with it case by case? Uh, what's staff's feeling on that? I don't want to jump on Jackie's toes here, but we do have different standards for heights in, in the code right now, um, in the proposed code. We are proposing to go a little bit taller for those commercial and manufacturing districts, but it's split out. Okay. Right, so in your more intense commercial uh, manufacturing district, you'd be allowed um, taller signs. Um, so for your multi-tenant monument signs, so these, these larger ones in the uh, B4, B6, and the manufacturing and industrial districts, that height would be 16 feet. Um, and then in the, the less intense districts, the A1, DTS, B2, and P1, that maximum height would be 10 feet for Did these multi-tenant monument signs. Did you say 16 feet? 16 feet in the more intense districts, yes. Wow, that's up there. Um, are we talking intense districts, something like Amazon? What do we go with Amazon? 12, 13? I think Amazon was 12. No, Amazon was 10. We were freaking out then, 16? Wow, okay. Um, I think I'd have to think about that one a little bit. Where would we see a 16 foot monument sign typically? Well, there would be the potential for a taller monument sign in the Creekside Crossing Marketplace, for example. Okay. Okay. I, for a guy that wears glasses all the time, I appreciate a bigger sign. Just wondering if 16 is the way to go. So, okay. So I think we may have time to go through one more sign type and then we can uh, round out our discussion with that. Um, so uh, the next one here is the awning or canopy signs. Uh, so that maximum sign area is proposed to be 30% of the awning or canopy itself. Um, and then that's proposed to be permitted only um, for ground floor, above ground floor windows um, or doors. Um, so not uh, second floor windows and then not for um, you know, other areas of uh, building facade that don't have um, windows or doors. Okay, uh, we just dealt with something similar uh, at the waters with this. That's uh, the nearest example I can think of. And if you haven't been by, it, it did go on and it looks very good. I, I think we made a good decision there. Um, I, again, we, we can't do the content, so to speak, and Jackie went over that. But I think there is a lot of value to this. Um, you know, I, I hate to keep going back to the square, but that's that's the most prevalent place you'd see it probably. Uh, I do think it would be helpful. Any other comments or questions on the awning or canopy signs? If not, I think we could squeeze in one more, um, our projecting signs. Um, so these are, um, the proposed changes here are really meant to ensure pedestrian scaled 
um, projecting signs to really bring down that overall allowance for sign area and projection uh, to really promote these types of signs you see in the picture in the Drexel Town Square, those that are really oriented towards pedestrians, and then ensure that as you're walking down the street, you know, uh, you know what business you're coming up to next. Um, so that would be an overall limitation of the sign area to six square feet and a projection to four feet. Any questions or concerns with the projecting signs? Is there a preferred location for projecting signs like corner businesses or um, areas that are specific to pedestrians like the restrooms? So currently there isn't a restriction on the, um, the location of the business that um, could have a projecting sign within a district. Uh, but there are, we can go back to the, um, the table that has the different um, you know, types of signs that are permitted in the different districts. Um, but uh, for example, in the Drexel Town Square, any of the businesses um, on the ground floor would be permitted to have a projecting sign. Okay. okay, we are at five minutes before the end of the meeting. Okay. Well, just real quickly, thank you all so much for all your feedback. This has been a great conversation. I know we went longer than we were meant to, um, but we can definitely circle back. We'll start off uh, with the, uh, the on-site traffic directional signs. So you all have that to, to look forward to uh, going into our next meeting. Very quick, I appreciate all of your time. This is probably the single most impactful thing that we can be doing to set this community up for the next 10, 20 years and beyond. So I know it takes time. You know, we've spent hours and hours and hours on this, uh, but I think it's, it's time well spent. So I, again, I appreciate your efforts. Do I see a fork and I see you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd really okay. like to emphasize how much work uh, staff has really been putting into us. I think I, I did the math. It was about 16 hours of, of calls and meetings uh, to really refine these and make them uh, what they need to be. So staff is really uh, putting in the time and effort to ensure that the product we're delivering to you all that's in front of you is really Oak Creek specific and really what the community needs. Great. Right. Thank um, you, Jackie. We have, to, we have to leave and log back in or? Yes, we do. On. There's a separate, there's a separate uh, link to log in. All right, Carrie, thank you. Carrie, thank you all so much. is this have an official day. meeting? Do we need a motion to adjourn? Was there a motion oh, to open yes. or no? Yes, you there do is. need a motion to adjourn. Okay, so nice motion to adjourn. Rillo moves to adjourn Adjourned. at 555. Paper seconds. Uh, roll call. Anna, aye. Sullivan, aye. Rillo, aye. Lorik, aye. Kavich, aye. Grzykowski, aye. Aldani, aye. Paper, aye. Chandler, aye. Thank you, everybody.